Um, so welcome everybody under Remarkable Labs. Tonight I will be presenting and uh, running the board for a case that I'm kind of present to Dr. Centaur um, and our discussants, Iman and Fernand. If anybody else wants to jump in and discuss or has comments, please put those in the chat. I'll try to watch them, but you can always unmute yourself and make comments. This is very informal, so I hope you guys learn a lot and have a lot of fun. So here we go. So you have a 20 year old gentleman um, who's actually a transfer from another hospital to UAB. He's presenting with AKI. Who wants to go first? Um, yeah, so I, I can go for none if that's okay. So um, thinking about an AKI, I think the simplest framework um, is to think about uh, pre-renal, intrarenal, um, and post-renal. Um, and um, those, uh, that type of um, framework, typically uh, I think I would need a little bit more information um, and a physical, you know, physical exam looking at um, volume status, um, you know, pertinent history, um, and, uh, like a UA and urinary electrolytes, that type of stuff. Um, so um, that kind of framework in someone this young, probably less likely to be something like BPH, um, maybe more likely to be something toxic, um, like an ingestion or um, rhabdo or something like that. And uh, that's all I have right now. Do you, do you have anything to say, Fernand, or should I go ahead and, and give a commentary? Yeah, uh, it's just curious. Whenever I have a 20-year-old with AKI, it doesn't commonly happen because I think they have a lot of uh, reserve in their kidneys and their uh, their RAS system and the, the sympathetic system to kind of preserve volemia. So it's it's always curious to especially if the AKI is severe and unless the, somebody ran a marathon, I think it's very important to rule out post renal and intrinsic, especially glomerular and um, interstitial nephritis. I mean, the percentage of these entities is probably higher in this age range. I find it really curious and I really want to know everything about every single medication or pre, um, like, uh, preceding illness that happened during the last few days because the clues might be in these uh in these events so um i really like what both of y'all said and i'm gonna just go ahead and put it in my own words um first of all i get i sort of cringe when they say aki i don't know what that means um and because that there's a there's a uh, book definition of AKI, and then there's the slang definition that we all use. And the slang definition is the cranning increased. Um, and the cranning can, can increase for a lot of different reasons. If it's really volume contraction, that's not really an AKI. You give them volume, they get better. If it's really obstruction, now why would a 20 year old have obstruction? I have seen at that age bilateral painless kidney stones, or you could have someone with a kidney stone who has who has a single kidney. So, or you could have uh, the, the the other part of the AKI is do is is this someone who comes with an elevated cranning, or is this someone who we have a previous cranning so we know it went up, or is this the first presentation? And we're assuming it's an AKI because they come in with a creatinine of three or four. So we're going to have to distinguish is, is it really an acute kidney injury or is this more of a chronic disease? So volume contraction is possible for a lot of different reasons. We're in Alabama. It, he, could, uh, he could have been out exercising on a very hot day. Uh, we, we don't know what time of the year this is. It could be obstruction. We always have to think about obstruction because you never want to miss it. Now, if it is actually a kidney disease, then we have to say, could this be <coughs> a true acute kidney injury uh, like ATN? 
or what would probably be just as likely for transfer <laughs> is what Fernand said, is could this be some type of glomerulonephritis? And so it, in addition to the uh, fluid balance profile or the basic metabolic panel, <laughs> your analysis is gonna be very, very important to see are there red cells, is there albuminuria? And I'm glad we have Eamon on, uh, on today. Uh, we might get some, some clues if there's a rash because uh, but what if he has lupus and we might, might get some clues from a rash or something like that. So I'm keeping my mind open now. We, this is clearly not enough information to know anything at all. And so we need to, we need to know who he is. Go ahead, Lindsay. Awesome, that was great. Um, so I'll give you a little bit more history. So we will say the time is September um, and he presented in maybe June around that time, or he, he started having some symptoms in June. He didn't present at this point. He had nausea, vomiting, fatigue, and low-grade fevers. Didn't really resolve in August. Had higher fevers up to 103. He was diagnosed with COVID, given antibiotics and steroids, got somewhat better for, for a little while, but then fevers and everything persisted. And now he presented to this recent hospital with fatigue, dark urine, hematuria. Yeah, I think the fevers had resolved at this point. Uh, do we know what antibiotics he was on? I think he got azithromycin or doxycycline, but it wasn't. Um, okay. It was antibiotics that weren't needed for COVID. <laughs> but, but at least they didn't go with huge guns. Right. Okay, <laughs> so. Um, <Or> miropenem. <laughs> he didn't get miropenem. Uh, okay, so. Um, and so now he comes with fatigue, dark urine, hematuria, and I assume his cranium is elevated from previously, which is why they're calling an acute kidney injury. So um, I got you dark urine, but I didn't get you any skin findings, Eamon, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, well, I think that uh, this is starting to, uh, some of that might come up. This is looks like it's maybe starting to paint a picture possibly a vasculitis. There certainly seems to be a component um, of inflammation um, with these ongoing fevers. Um, and anytime when you have systemic inflammation um, a, and particularly in vasculitis, you can have um, symptoms of fatigue. The nausea and vomiting isn't too specific for me. Um, although in a lot of vasculitides, you can have involvement of the abdominal vasculature, which could lead to those um, symptoms. Um, I don't know if the um, COVID um, is playing a role, like some sort of post-infectious reaction, but certainly the dark urine and hematuria, um, along with AKI, um, you know, we got to be on the lookout for some sort of glomerulonephritis. Um, and I think in um, young people, um, actually, I'll, I'll just stop there. Fernand, I guess we could give this guy a tumor. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the initial syndrome of nausea, vomiting, fatigue, low grade, I don't really know what to make of it. I, I imagine he was not an AKI at that point because he went to the hospital in August or somebody saw him unless they prescribed a medication on top of an AKI and they didn't know that the AKI has been going on. And these non-specific symptoms can occur in uremia. So the current symptoms he has, the fatigue, dark urine, hematuria, especially um, I remember from my AKI lectures that uh, when your urine looks like Coca-Cola, it's really worrying, especially if you have proteinuria with it. Uh, in that case, it just suggests to me that, especially if it's a non-clotting hematuria, that this could be a mesangial injury inside the glomerulus. And it could be due to a 
plenty of things. I'm really worried about the the histology of rapidly progressing glomerular nephritis. Uh, the etiologies of this could be anything: the vasculitis, a post strep uh, glomerular nephritis. Maybe he had a strep superinfection um, after his COVID. I'm not sure. Uh, it's unlikely. It looks like something is dragging in time. Good pasture in a, is another antibody-mediated entity that can cause uh, rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. And one really common entity is IgA uh, nephropathy, which can manifest as literally anything. Micros microscopic hematuria, macroscopic hematuria with some proteinuria, full-blown rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. Uh, and uh, the vasculitides, we're mainly looking at small vessel vasculitides, uh, the syndromes that are mediated by ANCA. Um, and so we have to really get a clear review of systems. The persistent fever suggests this could be an um, autoimmune disease. Uh, I can't think of other infections that drag in time and cause a syndrome like this. It, I would like to know if you had any uh, skin lesion or any strep throat uh, in the last few months, but it doesn't seem like it. It's generally three weeks between the infection and the syndrome. So y'all are doing so well. Um, I'm just going to embellish. Um, when I heard uh, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, and low-grade fevers back in June, um, I don't know how many of you have seen uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis. We see a lot of acute bacterial endocarditis, especially in IV drug abusers, but there's still the subacute bacterial endocarditis, which uh, hangs around for a long time. And you can get immune complex glomerular nephritis, as you mentioned from that. So it's not just post-strep, but a lot of, a lot of um, uh, patients who have endocarditis we'll end up with an immune complex glomerular nephritis. So I thought of that, and I'm, one, I'm wondering with the high fevers of 103, we don't have a real good story about the COVID. Was he COVID positive and that was what was causing the fever or was he COVID positive, but he had something else causing the fever all along? I mentioned lupus before, and I think uh, because of his age, we'd have to think about lupus could present uh, the way he describes in June, could have something to do uh, with f fatigue and uh, glomerul uh, glomerulopathy. So I think we're thinking, we're thinking along the lines that he's being transferred for a renal biopsy. Uh, if, he has, if he has a very active urine sediment, um, they, may have, they may have done tests ahead of time but he may well need a, uh, a kidney biopsy to get a precise diagnosis so he can get a precise treatment uh, because the treatment's quite different for these different uh, th things. Uh, let me just mention good pastures because I recently uh, had a patient who almost certainly had good pastures, um, but we never had a renal biopsy. We had a huge number of, of red cells. We had an an oligoanuric uh, urine. She came in with a creatinine around seven or eight. She eventually had pulmonary hemorrhage. She had anti-GBM, but there was still a debate over whether she really had good pastures because you could sometimes get that in association with ANCA mediated. And the treatment now is different. Uh, apparently you don't do PLEX with ANCA and you do do PLEX with uh, good pastures. Um, they assumed it was good pastures, but they, I think they broadened the immunological coverage because of the uncertainty. Uh, so in this, in a situation like this, if you, if we can, if, if the, um, if the urinalysis supports our red cell, perhaps red cell cast hypothesis, then a biopsy and a 20 year old really is gonna be very important so we can uh, try to target our treatment uh, just right. I love the IJ nephropathy thought. Uh, I love the ANCA thought. I love the anti-GBM thought, the immune complex thought. I would, uh, the biggest one that I would, add, would have added is the lupus um, because it's, it's so, seems to be so common. 
Lindsay, I think it's back to you. <laughs> awesome. I got two awesome. all-stars. It's making it easy for me. I know they're doing great. Um, so just to clarify, so no skin lesions, no sore throat, um, no other really big things on review of systems that we missed or haven't talked about yet. So that's- Let me just that's make one comment about the sore throat. Mm -hmm. uh, you're more likely to get glomerulonephritis from a skin infection than from uh, pharyngitis. It is really, really rare after pharyngitis. It's one of the things we were all taught, but you really just almost never see it. And there, it is so rare that even though there, there were some randomized control trials that showed that antibiotics decreased acute rheumatic fever, there were not enough cases of glomerulonephritis compared to acute rheumatic fever, which is extraordinarily rare in the U.S. these days, to show that antibiotics would prevent acute glomerulonephritis, acute post-strep glomerulonephritis. Awesome. So about our patient. So he has a history of childhood asthma. He was not any on any meds prior to this hospitalization. His mother has a history of CKD3, hypertension, diabetes. Maternal grandfather has a history of renal transplant due to nephritis, unspecified. They really weren't sure. Um, some cardiomyopathy, no surgeries, no drug, alcohol, or tobacco use, um, not sexually active um, in the last couple of years. So I saw somebody ask that in the chat. So, uh Fernand uh, is getting his foods being I'm delivered bad. right now. So, so I oh know he's he should be back by now. That was uh, that was like three minutes ago. He wrote that. Um, so, does this help us? Does it help you, Eamon? Um, I don't think that it necessarily uh, changes too much. It certainly um, uh, creates the risk of premature closure with the. Uh, history of uh, uh, nephritis, um, it kind of, uh, I can feel my brain wanting to just sort of like close out other options and um, think that maybe this kid has some sort of hereditary um, glomerulonephritis. Um, and the cardiomyopathy, uh, bo both of these are um, in sort of the grandparents, so it's more um, far removed. Um, I do think that Alport disease is a, someone correct me if I'm wrong, is a, is a type of glomerulonephritis and it has a X-linked recessive um, inheritance pattern. So that would fit with him being a male and the grandfather being a male, but uh, uh, I don't know what age um, it presents at. And it looks like maybe it's X-linked dominant. Um, and uh, so this sort of, you know, incrementally tips the needle or makes me feel safer about thinking glomerulonephritis, um, whether it's uh, um, due to some sort of gene defect or just a hereditary predisposition to autoimmunity like might be seen with membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis and lupus. Um, but I, I don't have any additional information at this point to um, steer me away from that. Anything to add, Fernand? Did you get some good food? Uh, yeah, something basic. <laughs> um, so I, I agree with Eamon. Uh, I, I don't know what to make of the family history. The cardiomyopathy is so nonspecific. It could be due to anything. Uh, the This nephritis in the maternal grandfather is interesting. Uh, so, and also the CKD in the mother is this a glomerular disease that's progressing or not? I wouldn't really dwell on that or really chase that path uh, unless there's something clear about the pathology of the grandfather because um, the problem I have with his presentation, it seems too acute, too vibrant, too febrile for something hereditary to, to explain this. And I... I feel that he's kind of young for this presentation. Anything is possible in terms of hereditary diseases, but th this just doesn't fit the picture, especially if this syndrome of fevers preceded the COVID and is unrelated and is related to the more systemic process. I'm just being philosophical, but I'm, it's just to say that I wouldn't really 
make a lot of, a lot of this family history yeah i think that um you you both have the appropriate caution here i think we need to, we need um to make a precise diagnosis in this young man see if see you decide on a treatment and then we then we can go uh, genetic hunting and see whether or not there's an association um but I'm, I'm worried that that's a red herring. Uh, I, I just don't know for sure. Um, for the people who don't have English as their primary language, does there, do you know, have you heard of the expression red herring? So a red herring is yeah. something that you see, but it's not important. It sort of takes you away from where you're going. And, and I don't know where that expression, does anybody know where that expression comes from? but it's a very common expression in the US. So for those of you who don't uh, have English as your primary language, uh, you now have a piece of slang that uh, you, you will recognize. We teach all kinds of things here at, at Unremarkable Labs. Okay, let's, let's examine the patient. Is What are we gonna be mostly looking for? We're gonna be looking for blood pressure. We're gonna be looking for um, so, so we didn't get any history of edema, but we're going to check and see whether or not there's something that would make us, make us think of, of uh, uh, albuminuria. Of course, Anne-Marie would know the answer. Uh, so you can read what, what, she, what she said. I really like that. Oh, no, you Googled it. Okay. I thought you would just know because you're so smart. <laughs> uh, but being able to Google is just as good as being smart. So uh, we're really interested in the blood pressure. Uh, are there any other uh, any other obvious clues? And making sure that uh, there's not edema. We didn't hear about uh, uh, ankle edema, but we're still going to check. And we're going to look at the eyes because a lot of times with nephrotic syndrome. And even though the urine makes us think of nephritic, but sometimes nephritic and nephrotic go together. So I've I've rambled enough. Give give, give us the scoop. All right, so afebrile, heart rate 117, respiratory rate 20, blood pressure 145 or 74, 98 for some room air. The exam was completely normal, no rashes, nothing except for two um, important findings, one a holosystolic murmur at the left sternal border and two plus bilateral lower extremity pitting edema. Well, we were talking about subacute bacterial endocarditis before, and no one had told us that there was uh, a heart murmur. How, how loud was that murmur? I didn't examine the patient myself and it wasn't in the note, but let's just say it was really loud and that was really the primary reason why he was sent over for CV surgery. <laughs> I just didn't want to okay. tell you that <laughs> early on. Okay. so. This is something that I'm hoping that our, our international friends are better at than most U.S. Uh, residents. Um, and and I, I don't mean to be snarky, but I'm really tired of someone saying there's a murmur and not describing it. Now, this is a holosystolic murmur. What does that imply? It is not perfect, but what does that imply? An insufficiency murmur. Right, it, it implies a mitral, so it's it's systolic, so it would be a mitral insufficiency, or sometimes sometimes a tricuspid insufficiency. Uh, you, you have a lot of tricuspid insufficiency without a murmur. Left sternal border is what what has me confused because usually with mitral insufficiency, you're going to hear it best at the apex or even lateral to the apex. Um, now. This could be the tricuspid valve, but you hear it more on the left sternal border. Right, so, um, but which is not a bad place for uh, endocarditis. Now, I would suspect that when the patient was in the hospital in August, uh, that the patient probably had an IV and an IV could be a source for endocarditis. So endocarditis is still in our differential. The bilateral pitting edema fits with nephrotic uh, and uh, nephritic. And, and obviously 
we're dying to see the, the your analysis. Uh, the your analysis really is is where a lot of the money is. Um, did and I assume at the outside hospital they'd heard this murmur. Um, was did we have records from August? Was he was in the hospital in August? I don't think he was hospitalized. I think he was in um, urgent care or an outpatient primary okay. care doctor that saw him in August. So we didn't have any records to know whether there's a new murmur or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's see some labs and we'll look at the urinalysis. We have all, our differential diagnosis hasn't changed yet. Uh, we still have all those things. And we, we only have malignancy up there because Fernand is on here. Uh, I love, I love the idea of um, doing POCUS. Um, to maybe see something from the murmur. Um, and and, and we're, we're obviously uh, probably sent with an echocardiogram if they were sent to cardiovascular surgery. Um, but I'd love to know what that echocardiogram shows. But let's see what the basic labs show first. Yes, yeah, so we have some basics and a urinalysis to look at first. Okay, Eamon, how good are you at uh, at uh, all these numbers? Uh, well, I'll give it a go, and then you guys uh, point out anything that I get wrong or miss. Okay. Um, so uh, his uh, sodium is fine. His potassium is uh, slightly elevated, and it might be related to the um, AKI that he has there. Um the BUN to creatinine ratio, I don't know how, you know, I learned that in med school. I don't know how often people still use that, but it suggests um, a pre-renal uh, pattern, but um, you can get that same pattern in uh, scenarios where there's not true volume depletion. Um, uh, so I'm not necessarily suggesting that. Um, and then it looks like there is a hyperchloremic non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Um, and, uh, which is interesting because with, uh, an AKI, I would expect some anions like, um, you know, like phosphates and sulfates to sort of accumulate and get like a low grade anion gap, um, metabolic acidosis. Um, but I'll kind of leave that there. Um, the UA, um, I learned the trick to multiply the last two digits by 30, um, to get the osmolarity or osmolality, whatever. Um, so that's like roughly 600. Um, so his, uh, you know, he's able to reabsorb water. Um, and then the most striking thing is um, blood greater than protein, um, kind of suggestive of a, maybe more of a, um, that with, along with like the hypertension, more of a nephritic pattern. Um, the UA isn't always reliable for, um, um, grading the protein. So you'd want to qualify that at least with like a protein to creatinine ratio um, to try to get a ballpark to see if it's in the nephrotic range. Um, and then the, um, I actually forget the order of the, the um, uh, labs, like the uh, CBC. Okay, so the 15 is the white count and going clockwise, you get the hemoglobin, the platelets, and finally the hematocrit. Okay, so he's anemic, um, and, um, you know, I don't know necessarily why that would be. His heart rate is kind of high. Could he have hemorrhage somewhere, or is it just due to uh, inflammation? Um, the white blood cell count is elevated, which sort of fits with this state of inflammation, and um, the platelets overall are unremarkable, and that kind of steers me away from um, some sort of... Uh, Maha. So, Fernand, for, for what, what do you want to add to this? Um, I like his interpretation of labs. And just looking at the UA in itself, this is compatible with a lot of syndromes. This could be just a kidney stone. This could be a, you, like, um, if it's in a woman, it could be a woman who has her periods. This could be a, uh, this could be, um, 
good pasture syndrome, uh, not good pasture, IgA nephropathy. This could be a nephritic syndrome. So looking at the whole picture with this AKI, I mean, it's compatible with nephritic syndrome. The protein area doesn't look massive or predominant. We have to quantify it with the protein to creatinine ratio, knowing that it has its limitations and it might be overestimating the whole protein area in the context of AKI. Uh, I think if we have uh, a signal in proteinuria being above one gram and being mainly albumin, and if we see casts under the microscope, this is the next thing I would like to do, looking at casts, dysmorphic red blood cells and red blood cell casts. This is the signature of glomerular disease rather than a hematuria coming from the urinary tract. The next step is probably to biopsy the kidneys uh, I would like to have a C3, C4 because they could be low in, 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 in endocarditis related uh, glomerular nephritis or in the, in the post strep and uh, lupus and would like to complete the workup with etiology directed labs, mainly uh, looking for lupus, um, looking for a recent uh, strep infection, the ASLO might be helpful. Um, and uh, the biopsy is probably going to be important. Great. So um, I'm going to I'm going to go back over this the way the way that I see it, and just and that and just for slight contrast. So. Assuming that we have a VBG and we know for certain that this is an acidosis, uh, it is a, a, a normal gap acidosis. You usually don't get the anion gap acidosis till the creatinine gets quite a bit higher. So um, the, you, at this point, you're usually able to handle phosphate pretty well. Uh, the hemoglobin of 10 is suggest to me that this is a subacute rather than acute kidney injury, that this is not something that happened in the last three or four days, but rather something that has slowly occurred. That's consistent with um, a nephritic picture. We really don't know whether or not they're casts until a nephrologist gets warm urine and looks at it under a microscope. Um, that, that's The lab is not made that, that's not what the lab does. They don't, they don't find casts very often. It's interesting that, that it is a concentrated urine and perhaps there's a little um, volume contraction. The platelets are a little bit high. Uh, again, just another sign of inflammation. I'd like to know more about that white count and uh, what the differential is. Uh, and, but the hemoglobin of 10 suggests that this has been going on for a while. I don't know for sure, uh, but uh, he could have he could have had enough hematuria, but it does you know it's it's twenty five red cells. I don't think uh, I think this suggests that that this is quite significant kidney disease that's been going on uh, over time. So I agree with with y'all. I mean I I'm, I'm checking an ANA. I'm checking C three C four. I'm checking ANCA. I'm checking anti GBM. I'm getting a, a bitter uh, urine study. Um, I need an albumin. Albumin, the patient has uh, bilateral low extremity pitting edema. Is that right-sided heart failure? Uh, or is, is, is that um, low albumin? And so I really need an albumin to, to better understand whether that one plus protein means anything. So what can you do for us, Lindsay? All right, I'm gonna give you some of, uh, most of the things you asked for, please let me know if I forget something. Um, so albumin was 3.4. Urine microscopy showed RBC casts plus yeah. um, protein. Yeah, then ratio. If you want the numbers, I can give those too, but it was 5.9. And then you asked for an ANA. It was protein creatinine ratio was 5.29. Yeah. No, no, it wasn't. Hold no, it on. wasn't. My math again. I'm trying to write it down. 
<laughs> Give me a second. That, I'm sure it's not 529 because because that number is approximately how many grams of protein you have uh, in a 24 hour urine. And nobody has 529. Mm -hmm. 0.529. 0.529. Okay. So um, in the uh, in the heat map for chronic kidney disease, that's 0.5 per day, which is uh, type B, because 0 0.03 to 0 0.3 is type A, type B is 0.3 to 3, and type C is, is greater than 3. So that's actually significant proteinuria, but this looks much more like um, nephritis. Uh, so we do have one day 80 speckled. That's certainly suggestive that something might be going on, but one to 80 is not really definitive. Uh, I think that it, we could get one to 80 for other reasons. So let's see what else we, what shows up. I think somebody else asked for compliments. C3C was low. C four C was normal at thirteen. Does that so, Fernand? You you asked for that. Yeah. What what do you make of it? Uh, how low is the C three? Is it borderline or is it very low? It was borderline. Yeah, I don't really know what to make of that. In lupus, in general, both are low. Uh, there's, there are uh, glomerular nephritis with a C3 that's low. And one hereditary glomerular nephritis is, I think it would, used to be called C3 nef and EF or something like that. And it, uh, I can't remember the details. It runs in families and it can cause a C3 level that's low. The other one that I could think of is a membranoproliferative disease you find on biopsy and it might cause a C3 to be low. Um, I, I need a biopsy. The ANA is not impressive, honestly. One over 80 could be nothing or something that's minor. Um, yeah, this doesn't sway the needle in any direction. If this was endocarditis uh, with it, uh, because it's an immune complex glomerular nephritis, wouldn't they it, wouldn't both C3 and C4 be low? I, I expect that, yes. Uh, but again, this doesn't rule in anything or rule out anything. Yeah. Okay, keep keep going. We're, we're, we're having fun, Lindsay. Okay, good. Uh, that was my intention. All right, so I heard somebody wanted anti-GBM. So I'm just going to start listing the ones. Negative, ANCAs, PNA, MPO, PR3. Somebody's mentioning HIV in the chat. Do, do we have um, uh, do we have IGA levels? I didn't write that down. Okay. But anti double stranded and anti Smith or double stranded and anti Smith are both negative too. Somebody said just said blood culture. Did he get a blood culture? He did, um, and that was also negative. And um, I checked him a couple times because he had some feeders in the hospital, and they were. Yeah, and I assume he was sent over with an echocardiogram. He got one when he came over. So TTE showed a bicuspid valve with severe aortic regurge and a um, vegetation. So, so um, this, is, this is interesting. So the whole systolic murmur was really a diastolic murmur. We're so bad at murmurs. <laughs> We're so bad at murmurs. Uh, so, uh, um, this is, a, this, is, this is a tip for, uh, for uh, anybody who's ever going to be in attending. Uh, learn how to listen to murmurs yourself. And, and after the resident and intern tell you there's a murmur, go listen to it yourself and teach them. Um, it, the difficult thing is we just don't hear as many murmurs these days as we even did when I was a medical student 40 years ago. Um, but... 
listen for Dodge Talk. Remember, we 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 mentioned uh, SBE. If if this is related to SBE, then I, I'm surprised that the C3 and C4 are uh, borderline and normal, but. I don't know. Could it be morantic endocarditis? Very good point, Travis. Uh, culture negative. It's going to be hard. He did get antibiotics. Um, and uh, But the severe aortic regurgitation with the vegetation makes me think of some kind of infection. We may, be, we may not be able to identify what the infection is until they uh, do surgery. Um, and so I have to talk to renal and rethink whether or not this could be some kind of immune complex, or do we have good tests for immune complex? Somebody help me because this is not my expertise. We don't see a lot of this at the VA. So nobody's answering. So everybody is in the same position as me. Um, well, I'll talk to the, I, I would talk to renal and ID uh, about that, uh, and definitely talk to ID about what do we do at this point when we see when we see vegetations on the uh, on the aortic valve. Um, perhaps uh, renal biopsy would help us um, to straighten this out, uh, but it's looking more and more like uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis, I think. Uh, so this is a good time for us to teach. Uh, for you to teach us, Lindsay. Did so first because his cardiac disease was so severe, he was um, underwent CV surgery before renal biopsy. He did up end up having both, um, and they did get a culture from the valve itself, which was um, positive for strep mitis. So he was treated for that. Um, and then he did end up undergoing a renal biopsy, which showed resoteric, GN, suspicious for endocarditis associated GN, based on the history and labs and serologies and, and all everything. So it was subacute endocarditis. So, so what we didn't know and could not have known ahead of time is that he had a bicuspid aortic valve. Uh, and I think that makes, you, makes it more likely that you're going to uh, get endocarditis by a slight amount. He, you know, who knows? We, we all get bacteremia. If you brush your teeth real hard, you get bacteremia. If you floss your teeth, you get bacteremia. And why some people end up with subacute bacterial endocarditis and others don't is a mystery to me. And I think it's a mystery to everybody else. Um, uh, I assume that with treatment of his endocarditis uh, that his renal disease would have improved over time. Do we have any follow-up? Yeah, so because of how severe the glomerulonephritis was, he was started on steroids in the hospital and antibiotics for his strep mitis. And, He's doing about the same. Um, so his infection has cleared and his kidneys are still recovering, but he hasn't needed any dialysis. He's still being followed in a nephrology clinic with a CKD. I can't remember what stage he's in now, but getting better, but not completely resolved. Right, so for, for, Fernand makes the point, he might develop CKD, but he might recover uh, because treating the endocarditis, if it's immune complex mediated, and I guess I assume it's immune complex Mediate, although I'm really surprised by the compliments, but that's why we needed uh, all these other uh, things that he, he, he very well may uh, have some recovery. So let's, let's go um, and uh, I would love to see in the, first I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Eamon and Fernand to tell us what their take home points are, but I'd love to see other people to put in the chat, what are the big lessons that you learn from listening to this case. And, and we'll read some of those, but Eamon, you get to go first because- um, Yeah, so- um, Because you're was, such a great volunteer. I was literally just reflecting on how um, you sort of, uh, from the history, I guess just from the age and then this um, 
high subacute fever called um, endocarditis from the beginning. And that didn't really pop on my radar at all. And I would, you know, as you know, with the skin, I more typically see the vasculitides. And so that's immediately where my mind meant, went. And I was just sort of thinking about how, what we see more commonly, um, how that influences what we're suspicious for. Um, and so it was just sort of a lesson to me to um, keep those types of things in mind. Um, and then another um, thing for me is just, um, you know, ANA is always such a tricky test. Um, you can, uh, it can, you know, because the titers can be um, relevant or not, um, sometimes it can sort of uh, trick you into heading down the wrong, um, the, the wrong path. Um, and I think um, reflecting on it, the, even if I didn't think of endocarditis at first, the thing that should have um, immediately triggered me to think about it was the um, physical exam with the murmur. So, Fernand. Uh, yeah, I, I think it, what I learned from this, it confirms my initial suspicion, is that in a 20-year-old with AKI, you have to be really vigilant, extra vigilant to not uh, blame it on some dehydration or something simple. It could be the case, but like make sure you do your due diligence to, uh, to ensure this is not an intrinsic and dangerous AKI, especially by doing all the uh, urine studies, quantifying the proteinuria, looking at the, under the microscope for casts. Um, the other thing is when you have an AKI that looks intrinsic and glomerular, like make sure you do all the labs that we listed look for autoimmune diseases vasculitides and you might and a complement and you might need um, a biopsy most of the time to document uh, the type and histology of and and prognosis of the aki uh, always keep in mind in these severe akis that are rapidly progressive just like their name they they can reach a point where there's total kidney shutdown or anuria and might need to consider dialysis even in a young patient. And uh, common things are common. Post-infectious uh, post -infectious RPGN is one of the most common causes of RPGN. So once you have RPGN, roll back, uh, go backwards and literally look for an infection, be it endocarditis, a skin lesion that, uh, that's related to strep, a strep throat the last three weeks. Uh, and it's the, the answer is always in the HPI. So uh, tra Travis uh, liked the analysis of the urinalysis. And, and I think that's something that uh, has become much more clear to me. Uh, the patient that I had with uh, anti-GBM, everybody thought was ATN. And except for the patient, I had 150 red cells. And, I, and so... I'm sitting there arguing with renal. I say, you know, ATN doesn't cause 150 red cells in, in uh, an old man. You might get 150 red cells uh, in a, a woman uh, who's on her period, but you just don't get it uh, in 150 unless there's something going on in the kidney. Uh, I happen to be right, so that's why I'm telling you the story. Um, and I, I and if you actually got a fractional excretion of sodium, which would not have been appropriate because the patient, I don't think the patient was oliguric, um, you can get a, a low fractional excretion of sodium with glomerulonephritis. The reason that I, that I thought of endo, endocarditis is because I was trying to think through my schema for, endo, for glomerulonephritis. This just smelled like glomerulonephritis all along and I didn't want to leave that infection. And as a resident, I did see glomerulonephritis from endocarditis. Um, so I knew that that had to be somewhere on the differential. And that vague nausea, vomiting, fatigue, and low-grade fevers in June was bothering me. How was, how was I going to explain that? Now, this could just as easily have been lupus, could just as easily have been lupus. Um, so I only... I only got the infectious endocarditis by being inclusive and not thinking that that was definitely what it was, but it was, it had to be in, in, in our differential. Uh, and Mario uh, did talk about uh, 
has a real nice thing there on uh, infectious uh, GN. Lindsay, what were your big take homes? I think I like this case because it, it takes you through kind of the, all the differentials for GN and AKI. I wanted to start with AKI, take you guys through this history and then the family history. So we can touch on that a little bit and then all the way to the very end and mentioning the exam. And this is honestly something I haven't seen before um, post-infectious GN from endocarditis. Um, and I thought it was really interesting workup because he had a lot of pools to think of other diagnoses up until this point. Um, so it's actually a patient that I asked the renal wards team for a couple, um, a little while ago. So as um, this was one of the more interesting cases they had. So, um, and don't forget to get a valve culture, try to figure out, make sure that you're not dealing with some kind of infection, especially. Yeah. So, um, I don't remember a lot about strep mitis, but I don't think it's one of the faster growing strips. Yeah. And somebody asked about risk factors for strep mitis. And honestly, I don't, not sure, but he didn't have anything that they could figure out that could have potentially caused the seeding. So how were his teeth? Oh, I didn't get to see him. He was on their team. So I'm not sure. Great question though. Yeah. So I think strep mitis is, I think, it, you know, all of these endocarditis producing strips um, are, uh, uh, don't seem to be, um, let's see, I'm, I'm looking up strep mitis bacteremia. It's an uncommon presentation of colon cancer. Uh, it, so it, does, it doesn't really say what, 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 what causes it. Uh, but it's an alpha hemolytic strip. It's in the mouth. I think probably brushing your teeth. Like I said, you do get bacteremia every time you brush your teeth. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, I think our discussants have both did an incredible job, Fernand, as always. And Iman, please come back. We would love to have you. Awesome job tonight with your discussions. I don't think. We left Dr. Centaur with very much to say at the end every time. So incredible job. Um, so please come back and hang with us again another Tuesday night.